The elites have gone insane and ordinary people remain incredibly commonsensical. That's the kind of story of our times. It's obvious that Islamist extremism, Islamist terrorism is a serious threat in this country. It is overwhelmingly the main terror threat that we face. This was not going to end well. This, this unholy alliance was not something that was going to work out for the values that they claimed to believe in. These groups, there was nothing progressive about them. Um, and they weren't so much anti-imperialist as they were kind of anti-Western and anti-enlightenment and anti the values that the left used to claim to be in favour of. I think there's a kind of profound bigotry of low expectations. Maybe it's ignorance or maybe it's willful ignorance, but don't understand the nature of what Hamas is. I mean, this is a genocidal cult. They've been saying what they're about for some time, and yet you've just got idiots sat in their flats in safe North London looking at it and saying, no, what they really mean is this. I just find that grotesque. What is the Islamo left? So the Islamo left is a term which has been used to describe a sort of unholy marriage, a sort of marriage of convenience, an unholy alliance, I should say, between sections of the radical left and the Islamist movement. This is something which the term kind of originally comes from French discourse, but it's something which I think applies very neatly to what's going on in, in Britain at the moment. And I think describes how over the course of the past 30 to 40 years, you've seen an increasingly disoriented, disorientated left um, want to kind of find forms of other forms of revolt um, and therefore allying themselves with some deeply reactionary forces in the form of Islamism. I think what we saw in the wake of October 7th with people on the left openly celebrating in some cases the, the pogrom launched by Hamas was an example that that has really come home to roost in that sense. That's interesting with the, the French thing. So, so what's the... Because I also only recently came to realise that Islamism in the, in the political sense mm -hmm. is a modern thing, like the last 30, 40 years. I only realised that recently. So how did this, has this come over from France then? Well, the, the term itself, if you read the kind of etymologies of it, it does seem to revolve around discussions amongst intellectuals in France in terms of the Islamo-left, the Islamo-gauchism, if that's how you pronounce it. Mm. Um, but oh, at, at the same time, it actually draws a lot on what was going on in the British left, if you read a lot of this material. So one figure who comes up in discussion of the Islamo left is Chris Harmon, who was formerly the um, editor of the Socialist Worker, which is the in-house publication of the Socialist Workers Party. Um, and he wrote a pamphlet in the 1990s called The Prophet and the Proletariat, where you really start to see the kind of intellectual trends, the malign intellectual trends we're talking about be articulated. So he says, kind of essentially, of course, they're reactionaries. Of course, um, they have all these anti-modern and deeply wrong-headed views. But at the same time, the Islamist insurgency around the world speaks to, I think he, the way he put it, was a kind of feeling of revolt that could be tapped for progressive purposes. And so there you see it very cl clearly articulated. And then you fast forward to 2008, you've got Jeremy Corbyn, the sort of standard bearer or would-be standard bearer of the Labour left, addressing a meeting in Westminster, referring to Hamas and Hezbollah as his friends, not saying these people aren't our allies, but there's something there we can cultivate, just saying they are our friends. And actually the, the, that quote, that meeting, which people often throw back at him, they often miss the worst bit of it, where he referred to the fact that the government had prescribed Hamas, an Islamist anti-Semitic terrorist organisation. The fact that they'd been prescribed as terrorist was a historic mistake because they were an organisation that were dedicated to the welfare of the Palestinian people, political justice and social justice and peace in the region. So I think in that space between the prophet and the proletariat and Jeremy Corbyn and his friends, you see how deep and consummated that um, marriage of convenience had be become by that point. Jeremy Corbyn's a fascinating figure. For those outside of the UK who don't know, he, he nearly became prime minister. He mm -hmm. was, a, well, we thought he was nearly going to become prime minister. He didn't, wasn't that near in the end. Uh, Labour leader, that's the, the left party of the two parties we really have. Um, and... Okay, so I, I've got a lot of friends who were supporters of, of his, mm -hmm. and one such friend had a go at me the other, the other day because I had Joey Barton on the show, who's a football soccer player, uh, who he thinks was racist. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Because I would never say to him, you can't platform someone like Jeremy Corbyn. But Labour were, as I, as I remember, I think, uh, what, what was it? An independent, uh, what were they? A group said that they, along with the BNP, the British National Party, were the only uh, political parties ever to be sort of 
what, what, what was it? In, intrinsically racist. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was the thing. It was. I think this was the investigation by what was it? The Equality and Human Rights Commission, mm. in mm. which had previously the only other political party it had investigated for institutional racism in effect were the BNP, if I'm remembering that yeah. correctly. Um, and of course, a lot has changed since then. Um, but at the same time, I think it is fascinating the blind spot that people on the left, particularly the woke left, have where anti-Semitism is concerned. These are people who are obsessed with racism, except for the world's oldest and deepest racism in that sense. They're also obsessed with fascism. They see it absolutely everywhere. And yet when you have an anti-Semitic movement, which is hell-bent on barbarism and murder and crushing all dissent in the form of something like Hamas, suddenly the F word eludes them in that situation. So it's it's a fascinating, I say blind spot, but I think that's a, that's a slightly weak and hedgy way to put it in many respects. I think they've... Um, uh, what's developed is an odd amount of actual kind of fellow feeling between these two political trends, it seems like. Is it just about that sense then you, you mentioned before of of rebellion or, or, or rising up resistance? Mm-hmm. Is that what's attracting the left to Islamism? I think that seems to be at the heart of it. That's certainly what, when you read these materials, you see there's this kind of sense in which over the course of the past three or four decades, the, the left, as I was saying at the beginning, be- has become increasingly disorientated because there was this um, the growing distance between them and working class people who were supposed to be the kind of agents of change, the agents of revolution. There was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so there was this shopping around for a new sort of radical subject, a new radical force. Domestically, you could see that in the move away from class politics and the move towards a more sectional, divisive identity politics based on questions of race or sex or sexuality or gender. On the international sphere, you saw this... Um, desire to find and seek out and to seek some form of alliance with these organisations, which, again, whilst they might admit in a kind of bit of throat clearing that they are actually quite reactionary, particularly on questions of um, race or not on race necessarily, but particularly on questions of sexuality and um, Mm. misogyny, certainly. But at the same time that they were kind of involved in a kind of clash against Western imperialism, Western hegemony. This is how they saw it. And therefore there was something there. There was something positive. There was something that could be potentially channeled. And what I think they failed to recognise is how this, first of all, was a ridiculous sort of diagnosis. These groups, there was nothing progressive about them. Um, And they weren't so much anti-imperialist as they were kind of anti-Western and anti-Enlightenment and anti the values that the left used to claim to be in favour of. But that also, that this was not going to end well. This this unholy alliance was not something that was going to work out for the values that they claimed to believe in. Um, but it's been so long, and I also think a lot of people on the left are so dug into their position of making excuses for these people, they find it very hard to crawl themselves out, as it were. Is there a sense of um, white man's burden? Is there a sense of, uh, oh, look at these savages, and don't take that out of context, people, it's not me saying savage, but look at these savages, uh, why should we expect them to treat gay people as mm-hmm. equals and, that, and not throw them off buildings and things like that? Absolutely, I think that's that's a huge part of it. I think there's a kind of profound bigotry of low expectations um, where that is concerned. I think you see that very clearly. You see that with the kind of excuses that are made. And I think you saw that really articulated to its most grotesque degree in the wake of October the 7th, the pogrom in Israel, because you essentially had people, in a manner of speaking, saying that murdering and raping your way through a country, targeting civilians, was almost like the voice of the unheard, like because of the fact that um, Israel and Palestine has a very complicated history, because of the fact that people have been suffering under the conditions in Gaza, that they almost couldn't help it. Yeah. And if you're saying that about any group of people, I think you've lost the moral plot. And as you say, you're also speaking to a profound kind of racial slash religious paternalism as if they know not what they do. They're basically akin to beasts. It's never explicit, of course, but I think that's the undertone a lot of what they're saying. Absolute madness. And the, the whole Israel situation as well. I mean, nobody seems to know, apart from almost certainly you and, and me and a few people who are sort of, uh, Douglas Murray talks about it, but for some reason, anyone on the left who I speak to about this doesn't seem to understand that Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. Like, th- and, and this that's what's led to mm-hmm. this. Um, and that, of course, Gaza shares a border of Egypt as well, who close it off completely. Yes, Israel controls the borders, but I mean, they're in an impossible situation, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And But I think, as you, as you rightly say, the inability to even accept what's actually going on on the ground and how it calls into question their own claims about this organisation. As I say, it wasn't just, particularly over the course of the past 10 years or so, it wasn't just that left-wingers were 
again, sort of supporting these groups through gritted teeth. Um, there were there was a kind of considerable amount of whitewashing of what organisations like Hamas were doing. Obviously, there was the Jeremy Corbyn quote we've talked about. Um, Lindsay German, who is a leading figure in the Socialist Workers Party, or certainly was, was also chair of something called the Stop the War Coalition, which is something that Jeremy Corbyn also used to chair back in 2006, if I remember correctly, she was addressing a conference, and said that um, as much as I might have my disagreements with Hamas and Hezbollah, I'd rather be in their camp because democracy in the Middle East is Hamas, is Hezbollah. And given the fact that 2006 was the last time that Hamas run Gaza had an election, <laughs> you see how profoundly wrong-headed that particular position was. But um, what I have been quite struck by is that I thought as soon as October 7th unfurled, and very early on it was obvious what was going on here, that this wasn't attacking military outposts just. This, wasn't, this was targeting civilians. This was everyone from babies to grandmothers who had survived the Holocaust. This was people dancing at a music festival. And it was obvious that this was a, a pogrom on a, on, a, on a huge and almost like apocalyptic scale. I genuinely thought, quite naively as it turns out, that there would be some people on the left, the more mm. honest brokers maybe, who would be forced to reassess. I often felt like almost like the Iron Dome over Israel that would shoot down Hamas's rockets most of the time was almost like useful for them because it kind of protected the Western left from the consequences of their own luxury beliefs, that as long as it was kept to something that they could kind of play down that wasn't so brutal and on such a large scale that they could pretend that there was something potentially positive about this group or at least something that one could make excuses for. Um, after October 7th, that was impossible to do, but they kept doing it. I mean, they would try and chase the subject or they would engage in this grotesque sort of atrocity denial, which is something that maybe we can talk about. But um, yes, I, it's been fascinating how when their whole kind of worldview where Israel-Palestine is concerned, certainly where Islamism is concerned, has been so brutally exposed, they have only really been able to double down. Um, and that certainly doesn't speak well of them, but it is striking, I think. The only people I've seen move are Jewish people I know who maybe held sympathies for sort of woke causes and things. Uh, maybe they work in academia mm -hmm. and publishing, those kinds of places where everyone around them is, is woke, so they hold these kinds of views. And suddenly they're turning around and going, what? wait, hang on. <laughs> you know, because I, I've got friends, again, who, who've got, other friends they work with every day, and those colleagues are putting things on Instagram saying that October seventh mm -hmm. was uh, just oh that's you think that's terrorism. This is the this is what freedom fighting mm -hmm. looks like, and it's like what you know sexually attacking random Jewish civilians. That's freedom fighting. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary thing. And then I've got you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're Jewish, because uh, like a, a friend of mine was trying to suggest that Jews were very comfortable with that old old argument, like oh Jews are fine, they don't count as a minority because they tend to vote. Tory. Um, so there was this idea of like, they're the only minority that vote Tory, therefore they're okay. And it fails to notice that firstly, a lot of working class people are voting Tory these days. And secondly, a lot of Jews are moved that way mm. by not feeling comfortable in Labour, not feeling comfortable in woke communities who they see as their biggest enemy now. No, absolutely. I mean, the Jewish support for the Labour Party used to be huge. It wasn't that long ago. And um, that used to be considered the sort of natural home. And even before Jeremy Corbyn, there was a sort of move away because of the sense of sensing where the wind was blowing on the Israel-Palestine question, but also the the silence of the left, if not the complicity of sections of the left in the rise of anti-Semitism, which again, I think is so striking because we do live at a time in which we talk about racism constantly, almost to the point of trivialities, you know, asking where someone mm. is from becomes a, a media discussion that lasts days and days and days, as happened with that uh, that royal aide who was hauled over the coals for asking that question. Yeah. And yet, when it comes to anti-Semitism, something which we've had a serious problem with since before October 7th, but obviously it has exploded since then, the Community Security Trust, the Jewish charity, have said there's been a 100% increase in anti-Semitic assault. So we're not just here talking about graffiti or people saying horrible things on the internet. We're talking about actual assaults. It's exploded since October 7th, highest rate for 40 years. But even before then, I was always really struck by the fact that you would have, for instance, I think there's a there's a Jewish cemetery in Kent, which has been desecrated, I think, eight times in the past 10 years. And that story never really makes it out of almost the local news or the Jewish Chronicle. Um, so how even during this period of the Great Awakening, as it were, when we were told that this is all about justice and anti-racism and listening to the concerns of minorities and their experiences and so on, this anti-Semitism that was being kindled in our midst, as, as it were, was completely ignored and absented from that conversation. People were genuinely ignorant that it's even going on. And so you, in, a, in a sense, you can understand why people were maybe either taken aback or slightly tin-eared to 
what happened in the wake of October 7th, didn't understand where it had come from. Mm. But there's no excuse for dismissing it when it is presented to you, which many people seem to have done. You know what's sad is that even as we're speaking now, there's my YouTube brain, mm. which is which is one of my brains at the back of my brain, is going, this, this might not be good for YouTube because I know that both sides... The left are going to be going, or the woke are going to be going, who cares? They, they don't deserve it. And then the, on the far right, you've got the Candace Owen mm -hmm. stuff. She's been, you know, in the Kanye West. She's turned, she's just gone fully off a cliff, um, which is a shame because she's so good on certain other topics, Candace. But I don't know, what, what did you make of that? Have you been following Candace at all? Well, it seems like there is a section of what you might call the kind of crankier end of the, of the anti woke right who have been really flirting, if not engaging in anti-Semitism, particularly since October the 7th. I can't work out where that line of influence is, is coming from. I mean, obviously, Candace Owens was quite friendly with Kanye West, and we all know what happened there. Um, but, um, and obviously, there's often on the extreme right, um, which I'm not which I'm not suggesting these people are, that perfectly sums up where they are, but obviously, they're engaging in some quite extreme right talking points, shall we say. Um, have, I've often had a deep problem with anti-Semitism, but um, I think it's a reminder that anti-Semitism comes in all kinds of different forms. And just because of the fact that we've been used to kind of confronting, particularly in Europe, I think, the sort of twin forces of like Islamist anti-Semitism and left anti-Semitism, mm. uh, that uh, that slightly older vintage on the right is still very palpable. And it's actually been interesting, moving away from Candace Owens, I suppose, but to talk about the way in which even some figures from the old British far right have popped back up. Nick Griffin, the former leader of the British National Party, which is a proper sort of neo-fascist mm. organisation, um, is suddenly all over these Palestine demonstrations. He's been appearing as a guest on British Islamist podcasts and almost making common cause with them. So a kind of, uh, a funny kind of horseshoe appearing. It's funny that because to Tommy concerned. Robinson's sort of gone the other way and mm -hmm. he's sort of an ally to Jews now. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, it seems to be a sort of schism of sorts. I'm sure they've got, they've got worse to say about each, each other, but um, it just goes to show that um, the reason it's called the world oldest hatred is because of the fact that uh, it comes in many different forms and, and also it has m had many different makeovers over the centuries. I mean, it began as a, religious hatred bound up with the idea of Jews as the killers of Christ. In the 20th century in particular, it becomes a racial hatred, which then takes on this kind of annihilationist sort of character. Um, and then most recently has obviously come in the form of supposed anti-Zionism, a preoccupation with Israel to the point of obsession. And what often ends up happening, which is basically a kind of projection of all the things that used to be said about Jews just onto Israel. Right. So Jews delight in the murder of babies the IDF are slaughtering children indiscriminately. You, uh, similarly, Jewish people control world affairs. You would see cartoons periodically pop up in often left of centre newspapers of Netanyahu sort of leading whoever was the US president at that point, kind of right. as if they're on a lead. So this was something which um, has been developing for some time. But yes, it's it's interesting that um, all of the different faces of anti-Semitism sort of come back in the midst of um, the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm imagining people sort of screaming into their phones or whatever they're listening and saying, well, hang on, Israel is committing atrocities and that kind of thing. And uh, Israel can't be without blame either, mm -hmm. can it? I mean, so, so what, what is it that is exceptional about the way people commentate on Israel as opposed to other countries and wars and, and things? I think the double standards are really quite profound. I mean, first of all, it's because of the way in which people talk about Israel as, as having no right to exist. I mean, people would criticise the policies of all kinds of governments. Um, all kinds of governments have found themselves in war and conflict. Um, and never do people suddenly suggest that the, the state just should basically be erased. You know, that's something that which is quite unique. I'm, I'm fascinated by people who are so preoccupied with the Palestine question. It's not to say that people shouldn't be concerned about it or care about the plight of the Palestinians or what have you, but so maniacally obsessed with that one and yet for instance the slaughter of Kurds by the Turkish state over the years doesn't seem to preoccupy them at all and um, we could talk about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang there's all kind of different examples one could use in, in Pakistan there's all kinds of examples one can mm. use and yet it is interesting how it's only the, the Jewish state for which is held in this kind of level of um of scrutiny and it's also one thing that's really always flares up in relation to Israel Palestine but we've seen again recently People almost have the idea that after October 7th, which was a atrocity of almost unspeakable proportions, it's almost difficult to put it into context given the fact of how tremendous it was, but not just the nature of the barbaric killings and so on, but the scale of it in a country so small. I mean, the number of people who were personally touched by this in terms of losing a loved one or a, uh, someone they, a loved one's loved one, I mean, this is the, the connection to it is really quite profound. Um, and people were almost acting as if 
there should be no response. Mm. As if any other country would not respond in that situation by trying to crush and destroy the fascistic, barbaric, murderous movement that had just killed indiscriminately its own civilians. No other country would be expected to put up with that. And yet Israel is almost expected to allow itself to be attacked. So it's again, it's not to say that this isn't a complicated history. It's not to say that the, um, people should um, refrain from criticizing the policies of the Israeli government or the Israeli military. It's to say that these double standards are really profound and obvious and, and it ends up in a situation where people almost see it, see it as illegitimate for the IDF to go after Hamas in any way, shape or form, which surely to anyone must seem ridiculous, but apparently not. It's it's extraordinary and and really galling. What's really galling is, is that idea of they should allow themselves to be attacked. That is also one of the anti-Semitic things that's mm -hmm. often said about Holocaust survivors or people who were in the Holocaust. What was wrong with those Jews because they uh, let themselves be attacked? There was something inhuman about them. Why didn't they fight back? And there are plenty of examples where they did fight back, of course, mm -hmm. and just lost because there was an entire uh, army against them. Um, and now, all these years later, it's, oh, why don't you just let yourself be attacked? And then we saw, I mean, one of the places where I've seen a, a particularly high amount of anti-Semitism is Ireland. And I think Ireland... Probably they, they identify as sort of the the oppressed rather than the oppressors, and that's part of what that is. And so you're always hearing this anti-Israel stuff from out, coming out of Ireland. Obviously, not all Irish people, but mm. just a high percentage of people. And then there was one attack. There was one potentially Islamist attack. Someone got stabbed at a, a school, I think it was, a teacher, I think, got stabbed. They burned down the whole city. They burned down a refugee hotel, like the way Irish people reacted. And you just think, if there were dozens of rockets being flown into your country every day, how might you be react reacting now mm. with regards to Israel and Palestine? So that just, that's the hypocrisy. That's what people don't fully understand. I don't think they think of Israel as a real country of real people mm -hmm. who are living there with dozens and dozens of rocket attacks day after day. Not, you know, it's not not an easy situation, is it, to get out of? It's not, it's not nice for Palestinian people either, those mm -hmm. in Gaza at the moment. I don't know what the solution is. And um, I, I think people also, uh, maybe it's ignorance or maybe it's willful ignorance, but don't understand the nature of what Hamas is. I mean, this is a genocidal cult, effectively. You read its charter that it published mm. in 1988, quoting from sections of Quranic scripture, basically luxuriating in, in the idea of the murder of the, the Jews. Um, this is something that they have never properly repudiated, despite some claims um, from the Israelophobic left to the contrary. Um, even recently, I think it was back in 2021, you've got Hamas chiefs talking about decapitating Jews in videos and interviews and so on. They've been saying what they're about for some time, mm. and yet you've just got idiots sat in their flats in safe North London looking at it and saying, no, what they really mean is this. I just find that grotesque, but they keep doing it. It's bizarre, isn't it? And I'm going to ask in a bit about some... It's, it's a difficult thing because I'm going to ask about some... Islam related stuff. And mm -hmm. I think some people will then shudder and think, okay, well, oh, is this racist or whatever? And then there is a difference, isn't there, I think, between anti Semitism and Islamophobia, one being a, mostly about a race, I believe, or ethnicity or culture, and the other about a set of beliefs, right? Absolutely. I think the term Islamophobia is really problematic for all kinds of reasons, not least because of the fact that it was championed and pioneered by Islamists to try and shield. Islam from criticism. Um, and that's the way it's often been very cynically deployed. People try to present any encroachment upon what someone has decided are kind of Islamic practice or any criticism of Islam or even criticism of Islamism as Islamophobic, which basically they're trying to suggest you're basically a racist. That's mm. what they're suggesting. I think phrases like kind of anti-Muslim bigotry, even though it's a little bit more clunky, are more what we're getting at is that sometimes you do see obviously open expressions of a kind of religious intolerance and almost racialized hatred of of Muslims. Um, that does exist. But I think the problem with the term Islamophobia is that it's very cynically used to just chill discussion of what what is in effect a religion or Islamism, which is a, it's a, it's a political ideology. Mm. Um, and so therefore, I think it's important that we sort of uh, retire the term really. But unfortunately, it's something which is uh, yeah, very cynically and commonly deployed these days. We don't get much Hindu phobia or Sikh phobia or, or Taoism phobia. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it just, it feels like if it was a racial issue, if people were racist, they would be just as racist about Hinduism and Hindus mm -hmm. in this country. There are many as well. I mean, there are racists mm -hmm. out there. And there is such a thing as prejudice against Muslims, as I'm sure there are, there are people who are prejudiced against other religious groups. Um, it's just to say that we, we should we should recognise the game that's being played when people throw around a phrase like Islamophobia. And what it's about is not about fighting racism, it's about trying to chill free speech, often for quite nefarious agendas, to be honest. Should people be worried about Islamism? And, and is there a plan 
this is what everyone's worried about. This is what maybe ventures into conspiracy theory or maybe it's mm -hmm. real life to get into a country, have a high enough number of people to be able to vote and then you know, what they'll be saying on Fox News and all that is you can't walk down the streets in certain places, Sharia law is taking hold. What's going on? I think the problem is that um, often the sort of more alarmist claims on the right can often allow people to dismiss the whole conversation about Islamism. So, you know, I remember back during the 2016 um, US presidential election, or at least the run up to it, and Donald Trump talking about, you know, half of London is a no-go area and all yeah. this sort of stuff, which is obviously not the case. Um, and um, as someone who lives in London, I can attest to that fact. The problem is there is still a problem with militant Islamism. And I think sometimes the sort of over-the-top claims made by some people on the sort of cranky right, as it were, can get us further away or can be weaponized to try and dismiss the whole conversation. It's obvious that Islamist extremism, is Islamist terrorism is a serious threat in this country. It is overwhelmingly the main terror threat that we face. Um, it's north of 90% of the people who've been killed in terrorist atrocities in this country since the 7-7 seven, seven bombings back in 2005, have been with that Islamist ideology behind it. Um, and yet there's still this desire to downplay it, to deny it, to forget about it as well. I mean, that's one thing that I find really quite disconcerting is the way in which we respond to Islamist terrorist attacks in this country, which is that we almost treat it now like a natural disaster. Like it, uh, the, mm. the anthem after the Manchester Arena bombing in which um, I think it was about 22 people predominantly young people, often young girls, because it was an Ariana Grande concert for people outside the UK who don't know about it. The response to that was um, a chorus of don't look back in anger. That became the kind of slogan. Why shouldn't we look back in anger? And then it also, I think, keyed into this, this mode that we often drop into, which is almost to treat these attacks like a kind of natural disaster, like it's horrible, isn't this atrocious, we feel for the victims, then you just move on. Because natural disasters just happen from time to time. But that it seems to be the approach that we're taking to it. But it's obviously a serious problem. And yet in the UK, it's been interesting where whenever people try to talk about it, they're just dismissed or accused of Islamophobia or there's a long-running discussion. You know, the discussion becomes about is the Tory right getting out of control because they're being too obsessed with this issue rather about the barbaric slaughter on our streets that seems to happen every few years. Mm, it's scary, isn't it? And it's, so if you, did, if you were to look back in anger what might you urge politicians to do? I think, well, first and foremost, is to recognise that this is a this is a serious problem. Um, and to recognise that their sensitivities about it should obviously come second to tackling it. And one of the, the reasons I find it particularly grotesque, aside from the fact that they're choosing to ignore or downplay or just try not to deal with a very serious terroristic threat, is the reasons why they shush that discussion or the reason why they shy away from that discussion i think are profoundly bigoted in their own way there's this idea that if you want to discuss islamist terrorism that you risk upsetting or putting off or alienating muslims which is to conflate islamist terrorists and british muslims the vast majority of british muslims want nothing to do with those genocidal lunatics in fact both globally and even in, if you're talking about some forms of islamist extremism even in the west the primary victims of it are often other British Muslims, members of different sects, dissenting Muslims, liberal Muslims, ex-Muslims, they tend to be really at the coalface of this form of terrorism and extremism. So to suggest that to talk about it is almost uh, divisive, is to suggest that it's uh, an unpopular position within the Muslim community to be against terrorism. So I don't understand why they're doing this dance. I get that it's tricky, I get that it's complicated. Also, you're dealing with a threat that you know is something which is about homegrown radicalization and people launching attacks you know, off of the back of, um, you know, just as themselves, it's a difficult threat to deal with. But at the same time, surely we should have a much more open discussion, not just about how you tackle it on the kind of security level and the policing level, but why there are so many people, even within our own society, who are hearing these narratives and deciding to basically go to war against the country in which they were born or brought up. That should be a conversation we'd be interested, we should be interested in having, but for whatever reason, we're not. And as I say, I think it's for deeply anti-Muslim reasons in mm. many respects. Although, is there also an assumption, and potentially correctly so, that a, a relatively high number of Muslims do have some sympathy or support for some terrorist actions? I remember seeing some polls in, like Channel 4 did some polls, I'm talking 20 years ago, mm -hmm. that showed very high sympathy for terrorist acts. Well, the p polling wise, I think it's pretty clear that the idea that there's anything like a majority or a high proportion of British Muslims who are in favour of this kind of terrorism, I think is, is for the birds. There are, there are kind of more nuanced problems. There, British Muslims are disproportionately um, more likely to hold or agree with certain anti-Semitic tropes, for instance. 
my colleague Rakib Asan has done really interesting work on this. And he also points out that actually the better integrated those communities are, or certain British Muslim communities are, the less likely they are to believe in those yeah. anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. So that is a problem. And of course, we shouldn't shy away from it. But even so, we're not talking about a majority. We're not talking about an overwhelming majority. So I guess it's a combination of not wanting to catastrophize about the threat, not wanting to isolate British Muslims. Um, not wanting to caricature them, but at the same t time to recognise that there is this problem, certainly with Islamist extremism, which needs to be confronted, and recognising that um, British Muslims can and will be allies in that by if if you um, if if you actually properly engage with them, which is what people seem intent on not doing. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because we know from you know criminals, we know from uh, all sorts of bad people. If you sort of welcome them in and you say, "Hey, let's talk. You're, we're on your side. We want to help," mm -hmm. they react much better than if you just go, "You guys are all awful and terrible." I think Rakib was saying that uh, he he would sort of change the way we do immigration mm -hmm. and look at the actual towns and cities that we take people from, which is a in itself might be a problematic way of looking at immigration. But he was saying we're taking people from some of the uh, places with some of the most extreme people. Mm -hmm. So, and it's uh, one thing that I think is interesting in the midst of all this is there is the the question of um, if you're talking about Islamist extremism, for, for instance, the question of migration. There's a the question of asylum as well. There've been various sorts of um, would-be asylum seekers who've gone on to commit terrorist attacks. If you think about the um, the Reading attack a few years ago, where three people were, were stabbed to death in a park. Um, if you think about the Parsons Green bombing not too long ago, so this is a problem. Um, that needs to be addressed. But I think one much more difficult conversation to have is the um, amount of people who were British born and bred, mm. often in some cases, someone like Mohammed M. Wazid, who became Jihadi John, one of the ISIS Beatles, you know, in sort of middle class suburban West London, um, in a pretty well integrated family, not an extremist family, as far as I remember. People might correct me on that. Um, and yet there's still something that is drawing them towards that. And yes, it's the propaganda of the Islamists and so on. And we are, we do live in an age in which international kind of Islamist terrorism was on the rise um, and was chalking up some depressing victories. But I think there's also a question there about what it is that we as a society are doing. And I think one of the big problem is in our discussions around Islamophobia, a lot of the narratives that Rakib challenges very well that come from particularly the identitarian left that British society and Western society is a terrible place for Muslims, even though you poll British Muslims and most of them say it's a great place for Muslims. <laughs> um, that that argument that the West is sort of rotten and Islamophobic and at war with them and so on, um, you, that sort of situation in which the message being propagandized by the Islamists and also the sort of identitarian establishment chime. So I think there is there is something to be said about what it is that when we're talking about homegrown extremism, what is it that they're also picking up from our own society that is leading them down that path to a certain degree? Is it possible to be woke um, you know, in with your mates, your student friends and all the trans and this and that, mm -hmm. and to also be very much against Islamism? Well, you don't find many of them, do you? I mean, that's the interesting no. thing is for whatever reason, I think it does, it points to a broader issue, which is the fact that um, we might have thought of, um, and we we're talking about this in relation to anti-Semitism as well. You have thoroughly woke people who don't seem to understand anti-Semitism, often don't seem to care about anti-Semitism, mm. sometimes engage in anti-Semitism. And you think why that is. And I think it comes down to the simple point, which is that wokeness is not what it claims to be. Wokeness is basically presented to people, or it's passed off as a new form of anti-racism, a new form of well, you know, social justice politics, although that phrase has been compromised for some time now, a new form of, again, kind of speaking up for the downtrodden and so on. It's clearly not. I mean, it's clearly just a new high, racial hierarchy, slightly different from the old one, although Jews still don't do very well in no. it, um, that has been ushered in. And I think that's one thing that's become really obvious and one thing that is so important that we refuse these people the moral high ground because there is still this tendency to see left identity politics, wokeness, whatever you want to call it, as people who have their kind of hearts in the right place, but have just taken a little bit too far, become a bit too intolerant, or become a bit too zealous. That might be true of some people who have just sort of picked it up via osmosis, you know, sort of soft wokesters as, you, as it were. But in terms of the, the hardcore identitarians, I don't think those things apply. I think they're engaged in a f explicitly divisive, racialized form of politics. And it should be called out on those terms rather than seeing them as... Um, people who are on the side of the angels but are just getting a little bit carried away, which is the way we often talk about them. Mm, that's always been the issue with learning about the left instead of the right, mm -hmm. um, the Bolsheviks and the Stasi. I mean, these were psychopaths, the leaders anyway, uh, as much as anyone else. And then the banality of, of evil sort of carried the rest of the population that way. Makes me wonder sometimes, and I'm a bit of a nihilist, I don't know what you think of this, but 
are humans just a bit not shit but <laughs> do we just do we i mean we've grown up in tribes right evolutionarily it feels like we want to say to certain people you're out mm -hmm. you know and you look different from me you're out and it's just that our society is the only thing sort of stopping us from doing that but every now and then a society will lean in a certain way that makes it look morally righteous mm -hmm. to do that and that's what woke culture is doing now well it's, it's a difficult one because you know you often hear people who are from a kind of evolutionary biologist or evolutionary mm. psychologist a lot of those people knocking around the anti-woke movement as you might have noticed who yeah. will make this kind of argument on the one hand i'm not really qualified to deal with it it's not something i've studied necessarily on the other hand it feels like a bit neat explanation for things where there is such a thing as politics there is such a thing as ideology there are such things as kind of intellectual and social currents which can lead to a situation where people are being turned against one another in a way they might not have been done that that might not have happened even in the relatively recent past but even if that was the case i that you know, this is something which is, if we just take as given for a moment, it's kind of hardwired socially, mm -hmm. biologically, whatever. It doesn't really help you respond to the questions of today at all. So I think the big mm -hmm. part of the the reason that we find ourselves in this mess on all kinds of different issues, the reason the reason that we do have this new divisiveness in society, this new racialism in society, what I think is the kind of rehabilitation rehabilitation of racism misogyny even homophobia but on woke terms that you often see take place is because of the fact that there have been intellectual currents particularly on the left which have got out of control which have completely rejected universal values enlightenment values um, and which and i think a big problem with the left as well is the fact that as it's drifted further and further away from what used to be its main constituency i.e the working class um, the more barbaric it's become, the more it's kind of disappeared into the academy, into the media, kind of up its own fundament, the the less it's had that civilizing influence of ordinary people. And as a consequence of that, it's now not only implacably opposed to the working class in many respects, but has also taken on board some very questionable, to say the least, kind of ideas. So I guess in a, in a roundabout way, I think that um, there is still a big intellectual political battle to be had. And I think um, that whilst we can speculate about you know, trends over millennia, it, it might be a better place to talk about what's happened over the past few decades that have ended up in a situation where to be anti-racist now means something that is the inversion of what it used to mean. I like um, disappeared up its own fundament because mm. it's it's very apt, but also sounds, it's, yeah, pleasingly euphemistic. More polite it? than, you know. But there's a euphemistic sort of, you know, <laughs> you've disappeared up your own fundament, mate. I, I like that. Yeah, really, that sounds good. I'm going to start saying that to people. Mate, <laughs> you have really disappeared up your own fundament recently. I've really noticed it and everyone else has. Um, what are some of those enlightenment values that mm -hmm. people are losing track of? Well, I think this is one thing that's um, has been happening, particularly to the left, for a long time. And whilst um, I should say, I think the reason that I f we at Spikes and people who are involved in kind of anti-woke commentary or whatever mm. you might want to call it, focus on them so much is they do set the cultural agenda to such a large degree. They are the kind of new clerisy that's, that's supposedly kind of woke, left-wing, identitarian, whatever you want to call them, values really do inform a lot of our political discussion. But So it's downstream from a lot of those intellectual trends. But I think what we basically had was a combination of things. I mean, one thing that you, you've seen, particularly in the wake of the Israel-Palestine conflict in October 7th, is that a left-wing tradition of kind of anti-imperialism has just morphed and dissolved into anti-Westernism. Um, that whereas a kind of previous generation would see great value in the notions of the Enlightenment and want to take them even further than they had done previously, there is now this identitarian term, which is to say these are just dead white European males, mm. that even if these values are good, they maybe don't really apply to everyone, um, which again is quite a racially questionable concept. It's almost suggesting that these values are fine, you know, human rights and <laughs> liberty and respecting minorities and whatever, but it's just a white thing. It's a ridiculous position to stake out. But as I say, there's been this turn against Enlightenment values under the veil of being kind of anti-imperialist or under the veil of being, um, again, more interested in other cultures or what have you, or being multicultural. Um, there's, of course, the sort of turn away from freedom of speech, from the most fundamental liberties, which again were fundamental values to the left not that long ago. Some of the some great articulations of of the importance of free speech came from leftist progressives, radicals of various different ilks. Um, people used to see free speech, even relatively recently in the 60s and 70s, free speech is the great weapon against prejudice and intolerance and whatever. You do not hear that today at all. There, that tendency has almost completely evaporated. Um, and increasing democracy is the other one. I mean, it's been really fascinating to see, particularly in the kind of period after Brexit and the rise of populism, 
is that you had supposed left wingers openly flirt with notions of the franchise maybe being a bit of a mistake that maybe it needs to be limited maybe the fact that that basically just repeating all of the old slurs of like the Victorian era that used to be made against working class people is that you can't really give them the vote because they'll just be hoodwinked by demagogues or they'll just vote whatever way um, some rabble rouser tells them to and therefore it's a bad idea so across we're seeing this across the board I mean I'm it's it's hard to kind of encapsulate in in one in one kind of sentence but mm. it's quite clear that things that used to be very central to a sort of liberal enlightened democratic tradition something that the left as i said used to, used to see itself as the radical progression of that it's now repudiated a lot of those values pretty explicitly i suppose some of those are real concerns aren't they i mean anything that we go for seems to be politically seems mm-hmm. to be at least i think the 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 best bad result you know the or the, the the least bad thing mm-hmm. and democracy is just, is of course it has its issues because those are things that happen i mean i used to live in south america mm-hmm. uh, we've seen how people do just follow uh populist presidents and it can lead to terrible things but maybe it's the best of a bad or the least bad thing we have well i, I kind of think that i try and turn that on its head a little bit insofar mm. as i think that um democracy is so overwhelmingly a positive thing it's just very easy to to forget that in the midst of election results that might not go the way people want them to or there's this tendency nowadays to try and kind of second guess what the views of the electorate are um to ascribe motives to them that aren't actually true you know to suggest that brexit was purely because people just wanted to to kick black and brown people out of the country even though that to the extent that brexit was a discussion about migration it was about largely white migration from the european union instantly um so i think in a sense, the the question of it, democracy it's, it's a profound good, I think, and I think people should remake the case for it. Um, it's pretty obvious to me, particularly in the midst of the rise of all of the kind of horrendous things that are going on in society at the moment, that actually the bulwark, the kind of defence, the line of defence against the out of control identity politics, against some of the mad ideas that are taking hold in academia or in politics or whatever is ordinary people. The elites have gone insane and ordinary people remain incredibly commonsensical. That's the kind of story of our time. So I find it particularly in the context of that, um, people to be more sniffy about democracy a little bit strange. Because if anything, I think bringing ordinary people much more to the centre of public life would do a lot to take the edges off a establishment which is which has gone mad in various different ways. You can see why they don't like democracy then. Mm, exactly, exactly. They want us to be uh, as mad as they've gone. Uh, I, I certainly see, I mean, the Brexit thing, I mean, I was a Remainer mm-hmm. and then it didn't go how I wanted it to go and I got on with my life. As did most Remainers, I'm sure. It was only mm. really that sort of layer yes. who were had a public profile or were particularly upset about it. I mean, there, there weren't an insignificant amount of people. I mean, there were there were hundreds of thousands of people on those marches calling for a, a, a people's vote as if we didn't have one in 2016. Um, but I think that was part of the problem is that people would say, oh, you're just slurring all Remainers as if they're kind of liberal elitists who can't stand ordinary people. It's not that at all, but there was obviously a, a, a wing of it, a particularly influential one in the media and so on, who were explicitly, openly anti-democratic. I thought it was so interesting in the wake of Brexit, where as soon as essentially an election didn't go the establishment's way for the first time in a very long time, um, the response was so visceral. It was so unvarnished. You had MPs saying this madness has got to stop. The House of Lords have got to get involved. The courts have got to get involved. People, as I was saying, were kind of re-airing mm. anti-democratic caricatures, the sort of which you hadn't really heard in, since the Victorian era, about people just being idiots and sort of uh, lump and fools who are being led astray by Nigel Farage or any of these other people. So I thought it was a, it was actually quite a clarifying moment as far as showing how distant the establishment had come from ordinary people, but also how disdainful of them at the same time. So, But as you say, it wasn't all Remainers who were acting like that. It was just the ones who happened to have platforms and places in the media and so on. It's amazing their lack of self-awareness and, and lack of awareness, I suppose, of or, or humility around their own luxury beliefs. Because mm-hmm. I know that one of the reasons I wanted Britain to remain in the EU was I liked the idea of being able to live in lots of different European mm-hmm. countries. I'd done so before. I'd done my Erasmus student thing, which of course they could they could do another kind of thing like that where you mm-hmm. get to study abroad, but I don't think they have yet and it's less likely. But those are the kinds of things that like, that's very me-centric. That's very specific to me and not to the whole country and the world or anything like that. So I think I was, I'd like to think I was able to have some humility and go, well, hey, I want that. 
I'd like us to stay because that's one of the big reasons, but that's not going to speak to the 90, 99% of the population. So we move on. No, I, I think that's exactly it. And it was I was quite amused often by the kinds of arguments that even the mainstream Remain campaign would come out with. So it would be, you cannot vote to leave the European Union because what about young people interrailing, you think? <laughs> Is that really going to convince like a welder in Stoke to change his mind because yeah. worried that some... Oxbridge student won't be able to have a nice time abroad. And obviously it's all ridiculous anyway. People travelled in Europe before the European Union. It was never going to be um it was never going to be impossible. The other thing that always made me laugh and it would always come up was like, what about the roaming charges? Got cheaper roaming charges now, you know, you go abroad as well. And you would just think, are we really having a conversation about <laughs> the the line I used to trot out was like, you know, those who would trade their freedom for cheaper roaming charges deserve neither. It was ridiculous. It was an absurd kind of proposition. Oh, yeah. But um and also, I think this is one thing that really came out in Brexit is people really failed to recognise the kind of class element of it. Um, working class people much more likely to vote leave. And therefore, a lot of the arguments that the Remain campaign were trotting out, whether it was some of this silly stuff or even some of the economic stuff, didn't really work. A friend of mine who was um, reporting for a national newspaper around the time of the referendum told, tells a great anecdote of um, being somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but kind of Red Wall constituency. And he's out following around people door knocking with the Remain campaign. And obviously they're trotting out the project fear, the economic arguments or whatever. And then at one point, someone at the door turns around to him on a council estate, an area that hasn't done well over the course of the past 20, 30 years, shall we say. He goes, what do you mean? I could lose all of this. And it was a reminder that some people felt, you know what, an economic hit maybe in the short term is, is a price worth paying if it means putting our interests back at the centre of politics. And I think many people voted for Brexit precisely on that democratic question. It's certainly what you see if you look at the, when you actually poll and ask people why they voted for it. Yeah, there were nutters on both sides, though, weren't there? there the bendy bananas, passport colours. Bendy colors. bananas, yeah. Always, all, but then again, you never really meet anyone. I think that's the problem is that sometimes we, we caricature one side of the argument on the basis of the most extreme exponents. Sure. So as we were talking about with the Remain campaign, not every Remainer is Alistair Campbell, obviously. And at the same time, the Leave campaign, the idea that um, people were, convinced or even aware of these arguments about bendy bananas and that's why they voted leave is obviously for the birds but it's an easy it's easier to argue with a straw man as ever than it is with an actual person sure maybe most people are fairly moderate and sort of see both sides i don't mm. it felt it didn't feel like that with brexit it was the one time ever where it really felt like but maybe most people go oh there's problems do you think that it might be harder to teach um the problems with left like the the bad side of left history at school i i just remember learning about hitler and Nazis. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I mean, obviously Stalin's name came up, but the, the Stasi was hardly ever mentioned. Is that a little bit more difficult to get across to children that even though you think you're doing good, you might not be? I think it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I almost want to turn that on its head and say, I, I sometimes feel like the people who claim to be on the left need to be educated about left-wing history. And I don't necessarily mean about, you know, the Great Leap Forward and Maoism mm. and you know the Stalinist terror or whatever. I mean the, the fact that they used to the, the movement that they claim they belong to used to be 180 degrees opposed to what it is that they're doing now. This used to be a movement that certainly in its in its most positive iteration was really committed to democracy and freedom of speech and um, universal values that wanted to abolish not just racism but the whole notion of race that wanted to really kind of carve out an entirely newer, freer society. And yet you've got people who every day are completely betraying that sort of legacy. So in a strange sort of way, I'm always, I feel like people who claim to be on the left these days could do with being reminded of just how much they've kind of steered what used to be the positive movement down a very dark path in many respects. They also seem to, I mean, a lot of lefty or woke people I mean, mm. they seem to hate England and they say, God, it's really gone, you know, England's a bit rubbish now. Mm. And when I say, well, where would you live then? They don't seem to, <laughs> there's nothing, this is, uh, and everyone just says Australia. And it's a funny one because Australia's got really strong immigration, uh, whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't really let people in the way that we do. And it start, sort of makes you think, well, and they name all these sort of very homogenous societies. Japan comes up, some of the Scandinavian countries come up and you sort of go, well, I don't know. Is, is some of this, going back to Islamism, some of the things that the very people who want more Islamism to happen, is that what they're complaining about England? For. I'm so I've sort of gone into yeah. circles here. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the, the people have a very strange relationship with uh, <laughs> with uh, not just England but Western societies in general, where obviously they they, they seem incapable of recognising the tremendous progress that's been made. I mean, progress is a real dirty word these days, particularly on the left. Um, and it's not to say that one should rest on your laurels as a society to kind of pat yourself on the back because of the fact that women now have the vote and that we don't openly 
flagrantly discriminate against ethnic minorities and so on. But you do have to recognise it because I think the denial of progress, which happens particularly in kind of racial identity politics, particularly in America, but of course we're sort of downstream from America on these issues, hmm. is, is a real problem. Because if, if you refuse to accept that any progress has been made, how can you make any more? You've got to build on top of something. But also you just find yourself having absurd, outdated arguments when you could be talking about what is actually existing in the here and now. But I think it's almost like it's a... It's, it's, it, at this point, it's almost like people would rather engage with it in a certain shtick rather than actually deal with the issues at hand. But I think England is an interesting one as well, because I think particularly post-Brexit, there was a lot of this kind of self-loathing, national self-loathing on the part of certain section of society, the sort of remain voting class, if you like. I think a lot of that was just repackaged class hatred, to be honest. Yeah. I think they have this sort of vision of the sort of person who voted leave, the sort of person who would have a cross St. George draped out of their window, the sort of person that they see is incredibly unsophisticated and that's why they voted leave and incidentally in my experience often it's people who voted brexit who know a lot more about the european union than people who voted remain for no other reason than the remain option was the status quo example we know what this looks like mm -hmm. but in terms of people who actually wanted to make that leap sort of into the unknown as it were um tended to know a lot more about it and thought a lot more about it than your average so it's um i think a lot of that um all that kind of discourse we had about England being this sort of backwater and Britain being this backwater um, there was, was was sort of a f repackaged class hatred in many respects. It's amazing being able to repackage it in such a way that you can make it look like self-deprecation. You mm. can go abroad and talk to someone, you know, a German or sort of French person. Oh God, oh, we're terrible. And it's self-deprecating. Aren't mm -hmm. we terrible, the English? And really what you're saying is, I hate the poor people in yeah. my country. <laughs> that oh, is they're, exactly getting it. away with that. And I think class hatred, hatred of the working class, is, a, is something which connects only the trends that we're talking about. One thing I find so interesting is that the, um, the, the rise of sort of um, racial identity politics seems so bound up with fear and loathing of the working class. So in the kind of, I remember there was a moment in the midst of the sort of Black Lives Matter protests in the UK. I think it was shortly after the um, statue in Bristol of the slave trader whose name Colston yes. was toppled. Um, a couple of days later, a little art installation appeared and it was of basically a fat, bald English bloke wearing a string vest poking out of a wheelie bin. Yeah. Um, and he was, um, I think he had St. George on his mobile phone. And I thought that was so interesting. She had this moment of supposedly kind of anti-racist protest that was by someone kind of juxtaposed with this image, this sort of caricature of a sort of lump and proletariat idiot who they consider to be the villain of the piece. And I think a lot of the sort of post-Brexit moral panic that there was, this idea that all Brexit voters, particularly the working classes, were just really racist, was was an expression, was it was an example of the fact that um, when people are, talking about the country as being so infected by this poison of division and racism, whatever, the the implied villain of the piece is working class people, which is ridiculous because of the fact that working class people often live in much more diverse communities. They often have intermarry. They often, again, they're, 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 they often mix with the people that these uh, white well-to-do activists claim to be speaking on behalf of to an extent that they certainly don't. And yet uh, there's if you'd ask them to just draw who they meant when they thought of as some sort of vicious racist, it would look like that mm. figure sticking out of that wheelie bin. Whereas really, they should do art installations of you and me. As <laughs> We're the villains of podcasters the Podcasters are the big villains, apparently. Yeah, days, white but. male podcasters who are relatively trim, so we don't fit that stereotype. But I definitely think there's an element of, of what you're saying because I, I see it in, in language um, or the way that language moves in these kinds of academic circles mm -hmm. to catch out the working class so that I, I really feel that obviously, you know, the word coloured, that was out of fashion for some time. And it was almost as if they waited until literally the last person in England was finally aware of like, <laughs> you're not supposed to say, there was still a few, some of the old football commentators would still say it. They get like, caught out from time yeah. to time and that'd be a big... Scandal, yeah. Really what was happening was no one was going, that guy must be a racist. Because they knew that these football commentators, they often had friends who were from all sorts of mixed mm. cultures and different kinds of ethnicity. So they weren't really being accused of being racist. They were being accused of being ignorant and stupid and not knowing the latest call or the, or the most modern words. And it, we finally got to a point where I think literally all 70 million people in the country knew you weren't supposed to say coloured. The next day, they changed it to people of colour. Mm. Like it's, it's to catch, I really feel it's to catch out <laughs> people who are not at university well exactly i mean it's one of those things which especially because of the fact that like i might be wrong about this but as far as i can tell people of color was a phrase that had been knocking around 
America for quite a long time, but it was something that really wasn't said in the UK. Mm. Um, in parallel, you see this attempt um, in the UK to kind of cook up terms that have never been used before. Those, you know, BME or BAME. These are oh, yeah. these words that literally no one has used ever to describe themselves, their own community, ethnic minorities in Britain in general. Um, and yet, it is interesting how the the role language plays in all of this, because even though it's not necessarily a sort of plot, it is through knowing the right things to say, knowing the right opinions to air, knowing when you're supposed to use this word and not this word, knowing that it's wrong to ask people where they're from now or to do this and to do that, through which status is kind of conveyed, you know, and the way it used to be sort of received yeah. pronunciation and clip tones. It's now yeah. offering up your pronouns when you meet someone. It is clear that that, is, that kind of linguistic game is quite important to how these people maintain a certain status these days back to the evolutionary tribal stuff that there you don't want to focus on <laughs> <laughs> it always goes back to that but absolutely i mean how, how can you be how can there be an elite if there mm -hmm. is not a lo much larger group of people who don't know the ins and outs and mm -hmm. the codes and the social mores and that's what cults do that's what sects do that's what uh, authoritarian governments do it's like the people at the top know the right words to say and it only filters very slowly down to the ignorant masses by which time they're changing the codes at the top mm -hmm. Where can people follow you and your work? So the, the first place they should go to is, is Spikes, the magazine that I edit, uh, spikes-online.com, at Spikes Online, all one word on Twitter and most of the social medias. Me personally, I'm at Tom underscore Slater underscore on Twitter slash X as well. Please go and follow Tom. I've got one more question. Who is a heretic you admire? You did pre-warn me about this. And it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you don't want to sound too worthy. You want to try and be original. You don't want to say Christopher Hitchens. You don't want to say Christopher Hitchens. How many times did Christopher Hitchens pop into your head? Because I think every, everyone's so far saying Christopher Hitchens. Oh, really? That's interesting. <laughs> a lot he's, of not, he's not are. one I'd go, uh, go for automatically, but um, hmm. one who is um, a heretic I admire, but also I think um, informs a lot of the work we do at Spikes. I'd say Thomas Paine, okay. great 18th century writer, um, one of the founding fathers of America, effectively born in England, but obviously goes over to America just as the American Revolution is, is kicking off and becomes the person who basically articulates the case for it. And, and also just the impact that he had. I mean, Common Sense, his famous pamphlet in 1776, it's, it's read by, I forget the exact statistics, but a huge proportion of the then population of America was actually read aloud in taverns to people. Um, but I think he's a fascinating character. I mean, he's a heretic in a literal sense because he um, upset a lot of people even on his own side, because of some of the arguments he would make about mm. organised religion, but also a heretic as far as making some very daring cases, not only supporting the American Revolution, getting involved in the French Revolution, you know, being chased out of Britain and having his works suppressed because they were um, seen as obviously diametrically opposed to the interests of, of the regime, but also very willing to upset and castigate and get into fierce arguments with people on his own side, which I think um, is quite a, a useful reflex have definitely that's a great heretic thomas Paine. people go and look up thomas Paine. go and follow tom slater on the twitter and the the spiked stuff and we'll put the descriptions in the links no the links in the descriptions <laughs> and uh to keep watching this channel we're going to do a, a quick locals thing as well go to andrewgold.locals.com that will also be in the description and you can see the next few questions that you guys asked